All right, so if you will, grab your Bible and open it up to 1 Peter chapter 4, and uh, we're going to be in verses 7 through 11 this morning. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. The Apostle Peter writes, The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling, as each has received a gift. Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks the oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, and to Him belong the glory and dominion forever and ever, Amen. Thus is the word of the living God. Let us pray. Father, you are gracious to sinners. You are gracious to people who are undeserving and unlovely. And for this we praise you. We praise you that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So that we might have the righteousness of God. We give you thanks for your mighty works. We give you thanks that, that although we've, we've taken a life you've given us and we've, we've spent it on, on our pleasures and on our distractions, but, but you are ever faithful. And now as we turn to your word, we pray that you would illumine our hearts, give us eyes to see, give us focus, Help us to dig into what you have for us this morning. And I pray, Lord, that every heart that needs to be changed would be changed. And I pray for each person listening or watching this. I pray that you bless them, that you remind them of how much you love them, that you remind them of the goodness of your gospel. And for these things, we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of nations. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you are alone are holy, and all the nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. As for me, I've set my king on Zion, my holy hill, and I will tell of the decree The Lord said to me, you are my son, today I've begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the end of the earth your possession. May he have dominion from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. May the desert tribes bow down before him and may his enemies lick the dust. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the water covers the sea. And all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord and all the families of the nations shall shall worship before you. All nations you have made, these, Lord, will come and worship before you and shall glorify your holy name. Every once in a while, I encounter someone who is convinced that, uh, that the end is upon us. Uh, this is especially so with regard to the pandemic. I've encountered a number of people on the interwebs that have claimed to me that this is the beginning of the apocalypse and that we all should prepare uh, for tumult and perhaps a tribulation. And uh, this sort of thinking is nothing new, although it is certainly widespread right now. I've even seen articles in the New York Times, Washington Post, asking, is this the beginning of the apocalypse? And, uh, and, and this sort of apocalyptic thinking, it's been going on forever. You might remember uh, Harold Camping. You might remember that name. Uh, Harold Camping was the president of Family Radio, which was a a national Christian radio syndicate having hundreds of stations all over the country. And Camping began to uh, teach that uh, that Jesus would return on May 30th, 2011. And how did he get there? It was through a bizarre set of Bible interpretations, really esoteric readings of the Bible and weird numerology. But he managed to convince tens of thousands of people that his prediction was true. And at the time, I worked in New York, and I I remember going out to the city witnessing, and I ran into some of these campingites, and they were utterly convinced that Jesus would return on May 30th, 2011. 
And of course, May 30th rolled around and no Jesus. And in camping, he did what all good false prophets do. He just recast his prediction and said, actually, it's going to be October. I was wrong. I was a few months off. It's, it's October that year. And obviously, uh, Jesus did not return in October 2011. And many campingites were greatly uh, disappointed. And uh, like I said, this, this sort of thing has been going on since the ascension, really. Uh, you may not know this, but there was a massive movement in the 1890s, actually here in, in Connecticut as well as in the rest of the country, called the w Millerite Movement, uh, started by a man named William Miller, who, uh, using a similar set of bizarre uh, numerology, uh, believed that in it, the summer of 1894 that Jesus would in fact return, and millions of Americans believed him. Millions upon millions of Americans were absolutely convinced that Jesus would return in 1894. And when he didn't, so many people were so distraught that the historians have named that period the Great Disappointment. And, uh, and that kind of apocalyptic thinking, what is really at the root of it? It's a kind of pessimistic worldview which says, I'm just biding time until the Lord comes back and saves me. It's a kind of inward spirituality that neglects to see the world right before our eyes. It's a kind of spiritual pessimism that assumes that the world's going to hell in a handbasket and we don't need to care about that because Jesus is going to roll it up like a garment and move on. And yet that is so far removed from biblical Christianity. It is so completely unlike the teaching of the apostles. I don't have pessimism with regard to the return of Christ. I certainly believe in the return of Christ, and I put my hope in that and trust that uh, this is, in fact, a great blessed hope when Christ will return and, and make all things right. But I don't think we should look at that as pessimist. Rather, when I read these verses that I read you before, I feel optimistic about that. Listen to this again, Psalm 22, 7. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. That hasn't happened yet, but I look forward to the day when it does happen. I look forward to being a part of that coming to pass. There's a reason why God hasn't come and sent Christ and ended this age. And the reason is that there is a mission before us that needs to be accomplished. There is a responsibility that you have uniquely as you've been uh, peculiarly gifted for ministry and the expansion of the kingdom of God. And this is what we're to be looking to with regard to the coming of Christ. In other words, the coming of Christ ought not to make us complacent, but it ought to make us motivated to expand the kingdom and complete the work that he has put before us. And if you get apocalypse fever and you circle the wagons and you look inwardly instead of outwardly, and you miss out on the incredible mission field that is this world, you lose out on the greatest story ever told. You lose out on your part in that story. And I think that's exactly what Peter would tell us today, that the coming of Christ is not a means to inaction, but to action. That the coming of Christ should motivate us to live Christianly in a distinctly Christian way, and in these verses, these short, terse commands in each of these verses, there's some of the most profound description of Christian living you'll ever read. And I think if we lay a hold of what is here, I think it'll create a culture in our church that is at once hopeful, but also missional. And so let's look at this uh, passage, beginning at verse 7. Uh, Peter writes, The end of all things is at hand. Now, what is he saying here? Is he suggesting that in his lifetime, Jesus is going to return and, uh, and that's going to be it? Probably not, because Jesus told Peter uh, how he would die. Uh, if you remember, Peter denied Jesus three times, and Jesus asked him three times, do you love me, restoring him? And, uh, and then Jesus, the text says in Matthew, told Peter how he would be martyred. And of course, uh, that is precisely what happened. Uh, Peter was in Rome, crucified upside down for his faith. And, uh, and so I don't think what Peter's saying here is Jesus is coming back in his lifetime or even in the lifetime of his readership, or at least the first century readership. And we get a little hint of that at the underlying Greek. Uh, the term here translated end is not typically the term you would use to describe 
the final consummation and the new heavens and new earth. Rather, the term here is telos, which has some English cognates. You might think of teleology, which is the study of the fine design of of creation. Uh, But the term telos connotes this idea of meeting a goal or uh, passing the finish line. And so when Peter says the end of all things is at hand, you could translate that the end goal of things is all is at hand. He's not so much talking about the second coming necessarily, but the final consummation in redemptive history. I mean, think about it. All of the major events of God's plan of redemption have already occurred, save two, right? Uh, the creation has occurred, the fall, the uh, covenants established with Noah and Moses and Abraham, uh, the exile, the return, I mean, all of the things, the incarnation, uh, the crucifixion, the resurrection, the ascension, the only thing that has yet to come to pass is the gospel spreading throughout the entirety of the world and Jesus' return. And so from Peter's perspective, redemptive history, we're at the very end of that. We're in, in fact, the last days. But to say that we're in the last days doesn't mean we only have a few days left. It's a manner of speaking, a very Jewish manner of speaking, saying that a God is about to end redemptive history as we know it. But that doesn't mean it's going to happen tomorrow. Rather, the Bible would seem to give us, seem to give us the, uh, the inclination that, uh, that the gospel must spread throughout all of the known world so that every tribe, tongue, people, and nation can worship the Lord of glory on behalf of their salvation. And so uh, better what Peter is saying here is that the end of all things, the consummation of all things is at hand, both on a meta-narrative level in redemptive history and then also individually. Uh, the end of all things is at hand for us. The goal is coming towards us. The mortality rate is 100%, and we especially sense that today, and that's true about believers and unbelievers alike, and your end will come. The day you will die is coming quickly, and you will go before God either as one of his children with Christ as your mediator, or you will go before God so that he can give you the full amount of what justice requires for your sin. The end of all things is at hand. We're on borrowed time, as it were. We don't have all the time in the world. Rather, as Paul says, the days are evil. Time is running out. And in light of that, Peter says... Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Notice, in light of the coming of Christ, in light of the consummation of redemptive history, Peter's command is not inaction, but action. In light of this, be self-controlled and sober-minded. The term here translated self-controlled, the root of that term is uh, sophia, which is the Greek term for wisdom. Uh, This term refers not merely to self-control, but Uh, to wise living, to intentional living, to thoughtful uh, living, to living that is not just fumbling through day by day, but but a recognition of things before you. So many people, they, they live their entire lives only looking at what's immediately in front of their face. They don't think about eternity. They don't think about the, the big scheme of things. They just look at what is immediately in front of their face. They go from fire to fire, putting them out, but they never really reflect upon life. But to be self-controlled in this sense, to be a wise liver in this sense, means that we think about things and that results in a change in our behavior whereby we are self-controlled, where we recognize what is valuable and what is not, what is wise and what is unwise. Be sober-minded. Typically, we hear this term, sobriety of mind, and we think, ah, this is the opposite of drunkenness. And that's true in a sense, drunkenness, and we could also throw the whole gamut of drug abuse in there as well, but, but that's not what Peter is getting at here. The term uh, refers more to recognizing the severity of things and, and the weightiness of the things that matter for eternity. There are so many things in our daily lives which we think are transient and, and not really that important, but from Peter's perspective, some of these things are worth an eternal weight of significance. Some of these things are eternally valuable. Husbands, the way you treat your wives is not merely a temporal issue. That's a matter of eternal significance. The way you treat your children, the way you work your job is not really a trifle, but a matter of eternal significance. The way you treat the brethren is a matter of eternity, not merely uh, 
what is going on in our life at this time. And so to be sober-minded in this sense is to recognize that there are things that have eternal value and significance. The opposite of being sober-minded, I would imagine, is, is to be constantly joking and making light of the things of life. To have sobriety of mind means that we recognize the weightiness and severity of some things. Implicitly, that means that we recognize that there are things that are true and things that are, are not. And thus, implicitly here, Peter is saying that what you believe matters. Your doctrine matters. Uh, what you think about God matters. These are not merely uh, you know, uh, doctrinal nitpicking, but rather what you believe about God, what you believe about the gospel, what you believe about what the Bible teaches. All of these things matter, and so be sober-minded, And Paul, Peter says, for the sake of your prayers. This is like the third time Peter has warned us that uh, the way we live our life can greatly affect and possibly even destroy our prayer life. And this is true in two ways. Uh, you ever go into some intentional sin that was really bad that you were, you know, maybe you surprised yourself at and, and then you thought to yourself, how am I going to pray now? Uh, you know, we're doing the same thing really that Adam and Eve did in the garden. We we sin just like Adam and Eve, and then we hide from God, as if you can hide from an omniscient, omnipresent, and immutable deity. You can, but we try to, and so we sin and we neglect prayer. And Peter says, don't sin for the sake of your prayers. Be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. And then additionally, from God's perspective, if you're living in sin such that uh, you don't have self-control such that you're making light of everything in this life, God won't hear your prayers. And we've heard this before from Peter. Uh, he tells husbands, husbands, if you mistreat your wives, God's not hearing your prayers. You shouldn't expect God to answer your prayers if you're mistreating the, uh, the daughter that he put in your hands. And so for the sake of your prayers, be sober of mind, be self-controlled. And ask yourself, is your prayer life suffering? Is that because you've got unrepentant sin dwelling in your life now don't get me wrong we can't repent of every single sin there are sins that we don't even know about that we've committed there are moment by moment idolatries we don't recognize but are you in some kind of obvious sin which is destroying your prayer life are you in some kind of besetting sin that needs to be killed and if your prayer life is suffering maybe that's something you ought to think about what is what is your life like the Bible tells us not only to check our doctrine, but to check our practice as well. And if your prayer life is suffering, there's a good possibility that you are in sin. You should repent of that sin so that your prayer life does not suffer. Because ask yourself the question, if Christ died for all of our sins 2,000 years ago, as he did on the cross, those sins were actually paid for at Calvary's tree, they were all paid for. This is why Jesus said, it is finished, right? The sins were paid for in real time at that time, uh, while yet we had committed them. As, as Brother John said, uh, he died for those sins before we were even alive, before they were even committed. But, but so committed was Jesus to your salvation that he provided it for you before you were even born. But if that's the case, then why do we continually need to go, go to God and seek repentance and forgiveness? If Jesus paid for all of our sins, then why would we need to keep going back and offering forgiveness, or rather offering repentance to God, pursuing repentance? Why wouldn't we just move on with our sin and try to fight it as best we could? Why would we need to go back and apologize for, to God and try to make things right? It is because that while your sins are forgiven, that salvation has brought you into a relationship that you did not have prior to that. It's brought you into a relationship where God is now your father and you're his child. And that relationship, like any other relationship, needs to be maintained. You can't just disregard that relationship. And so if you sin, you need to go to God and make it right. That doesn't mean that all of a sudden you've lost your salvation and now God's wrath is upon you. No, it means that there's a relationship there that needs to be maintained and it needs to be respected. And so when we go to God after we've sinned, we seek reconciliation with God. We do that not under 
uh, fear of damnation, we do that out of love, out of the love that he gave us, that we might return it back to him in gratitude. And so for the sake of our prayers, we need to watch our life. And the coming of Christ and the consummation of all things should be the impetus leading us there, that, that because time is short, that is, the time of our lives are short, ask any person who is at the end of their life, how quick did it go? And they'll tell you. But also, time is short in redemptive history. And this should motivate us to watch our life and to make our doctrine match up with what we do. Then Peter writes in verse 8, he says, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly. Notice this. Above all, out of this virtue list here, this is the most important one. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly since... Love covers a multitude of sins. Now, why is this the most important facet of this, this section? Above all, love, keep loving one another earnestly. Literally, it's keep having love for one another. That's the underlying Greek there. Keep having love with one another. It's a present active participle, meaning continually, actively seek love for one another since or because love covers a multitude of sins. This is Paul's recipe for church unity it is recipe for the flourishing of the local church the recipe is is love love for the brethren a kind of love that you don't have for the unbelieving world a special kind of love that you have for god's people every once in a while i'm reminded of the fact that when i came into the pastorate uh there were a variety of people that left our church and uh, they left for a variety of reasons, certainly. Uh, I was definitely one of those reasons for many of them. But they did leave our church and went to other area churches, which it's always awkward when I see those people or I go to grab lunch with that pastor and see, you know, new member, you know, and there's that, there's that person on the wall. Uh, but I often think back to that time. And, you know, just as an observer, that was the first time where I ever saw serious and significant church disunity that resulted in people leaving a church that they had attended for years. And I look back to that and I wonder, what could I have done better? Or what could we have done better? Or what could they have done better? And I'm not pointing any fingers, but one thing I do know is that there could have been more love. Love needs to be the ultimate and foundational presupposition in terms of the way that we deal with each other as fellow Christians, and as fellow church members. That kind of love should be our default position. So that when somebody offends you, and you need to go to them because they've offended you, you're not going there to seek revenge. Rather, your aim is redemption. It's reconciliation. And if we act that way, multitudes of sins will be covered, meaning that they'll be atoned for. They'll be They'll be covered by the blood of Christ, and the gospel will win out. I mean, think about it. Does somebody ever really offend you or sin against you, and, and you go to them, and they think you're just going to chew them out or berate them or something, and then you respond to them in a kind way, in a merciful way, and you demonstrate that you love them? Well, what does that do to the offense? It just simply dissolves it. What is love fundamentally? Love is a commitment to someone else's flourishing. That's what love is. It's not mainly a feeling like our culture says. Rather, it's a commitment to someone else's good, even if that commitment means that you have to sacrifice yourself or sacrifice your own well-being. You do it because you love them. You're committed to their flourishing. And if we have love in the church for one another, as Peter commands, then this leaves very little foothold for the devil to cause disunity to cause disruption in the spiritual things that we value, to, to misalign the mission of the church. Because love covers a multitude of sins, because love is patient and kind. It does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. In other words, love allows you to be wronged and be okay with that. Because love fundamentally is other-centered, not me-centered. Love is the very opposite of self-centeredness. Love does not rejoice in wrongdoing. It rejoices with the truth. It bears all things. So when you're offended or when somebody greatly sins against you in the church, 
You don't bust into that consumerist mentality that is so prevalent in our culture and say, I'm just going to find another church that I like better. Rather, you're going to pursue redemption in that situation because you're an ambassador of Christ and a minister of reconciliation and because you love that person. That consumerist culture is so very common where we think that if there's a problem, throw this thing out and get a new one. The church bothers you. Something happens in the church you don't like. There's something that is said that rubs you the wrong way. Ditch it and find another one. There's 500 other churches down the street. But that's not what Peter's envisioning here. Peter's envisioning a kind of church where even bold sin against one another is redeemed by love. Fundamentally, love is is the willingness to be sinned against and pursue someone else's good. You can say that you love people, but if you're not willing to be sinned against and still pursue their good, then you don't really love them. When you think about the way we love our children, we, we get sinned against by our children all the time, right? Because they're growing up, they're learning, but you're nevertheless committed to their flourishing. You're, you're going to love them no matter what. And that is the same kind of attitude we need to bring into the church. And it's the same kind of attitude that will, that will give the foundation, the foundation of flourishing within the church such that, such that the church expands its mission, expanding and building in the kingdom of God. And so above all, keep loving one another earnestly. Love covers a multitude of sins. If you're wondering, what should I do in this situation? Someone has sinned against me, or have I have sinned? The the word you need to be thinking about is love. What would be the loving thing to do? In other words, what would be the thing that I might do where I might demonstrate my commitment to this person or these people's flourishing? And that is a wise path to live. Verse 9, showing hospitality to one another without grumbling. Here, just another participle. Uh, sort of connecting the last verse, hinting at the fact that hospitality really is simply another form of love. In fact, the underlying Greek word, the root word, is uh, phileo, which is the word for love in Greek. And so uh, hospitality is just love or benevolence for people that are outside of your circle of friends. <coughs> hospitality being uh, uh, care and kindness and, and provision for people who are not normally uh, at your dinner table or in your home. Here, of course, Peter directs the hospitality to one another, meaning the people in the church that you don't ever talk to, be hospitable to those people. Love them and care for them without grumbling. I've just been reminded at the power of hospitality. Uh, I've been reminded of that over the last couple of years, just in a number of ways, about the amazing power of hospitality. That's one of those spiritual gifts that is vastly underrated. Uh, you might have heard the story of Rosaria Butterfield, who was a, uh, a PhD professor at Syracuse. I think she was a queer studies professor. Uh, about as far removed from Christianity as you could possibly uh, get. And it was through the hospitality of a man and his wife, a couple of Christian brother and, brother and sister, that, that drew her to Christ. And in their non-judgmental, caring love, uh, she came to the Lord and, uh, and had sub- totally changed her life, changed uh, her worldview. And, and it was through hospitality. Hospitality, let's think of it not so much in terms of a quaint thing that, you know, sort of old-fashioned, but let's think of it in terms of a weapon for the advancement of the kingdom of God. And so if you're hospitable to people, uh, you're doing that for a reason, and the reason is the expansion of the borders of God's kingdom, not so much just to be nice, right? Hospitality is a weapon in the expansion of the kingdom of God, not just some kind of quaint uh, thing. And so if we're hospitable to people, why are we doing that? We're doing that to demonstrate our love for them. That is both true for the church and true for the unbelieving world. Don't ever be indifferent about lost people. Uh, don't ever think that they're lost, they're never going to get saved. You don't know that. People could have said that about you before you came to faith. Rather, use the opportunities that you have to be hospitable. Invite people over 
to dinner, put yourself out. And take really good care of your guests, especially if they're not Christians. Treat them with kindness and dignity, whether they treat you that way or not. Let yourself be taken advantage of in order that the gospel may be, may be given, in order that God's grace may prevail. Verse 10, he says, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. Reminds me of what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, To each is given a manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. The same Spirit, but many gifts. The same Lord, but a diverse body. And, and what Peter is hinting at here is, is that you have been given a very unique and peculiar uh, gifting from God. The gifting may be one gift or numerous gifts. In all likelihood, it's a diversity of gifts in you. And that gifting, combined with where God has put you in this life providentially, is strategic on God's part and is absolutely necessary for the building of God's kingdom. Each has received a gift. So whether you've been a Christian for a day or 30 years, you have a special spiritual gift that has been given for the building up of the church. And Peter says, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's grace. The language here is reminiscent of, you know, the librarian who sort of catalogs and cares for the library while no one's around. Or you could think of the curator at the museum who takes care of the exhibits. Here, we're the curators of God's grace, demonstrating it, exemplifying it, showing it. And it's not just one kind of grace, it's a diversified grace, it's varied grace. It's grace that manifests itself in all uh, different ways, and you are a steward of that, having received a bit of that grace in the form of a spiritual gift. And many of us, we walk in our spiritual gifts, and we use them, but many of us do not. And why don't we use them? Sometimes we don't know what they are. I felt that way for many years. I wondered, what, what is my spiritual gifting? Where am I supposed to plug in? And you know what the best thing you can do if you feel that way? Just find some place to serve and, and serve as best as you can. And what will happen is, over time, the church will recognize where your area of gifting lies, and then you will find yourself working in that capacity. Which means that implicitly that everyone has a ministry that they've been called to, an individualistic ministry that they've been called to, working as a, as, as a part of the church in order to see the church flourish and complete the mission that God has put before us. And so don't rob the church of the gifting that God has uniquely given you. Especially with regard to hospitality, because of course Paul says hospitality is a gift. I'm absolutely convinced, the more I think about this, the more I'm convinced of it, that there are just as many people saved at the dinner table than there are as the pew, if not more. And so if your gifting is hospitality, then you definitely need to use that. But if you don't know what your gift is, then just start walking in obedience and serving in some capacity, whether it's cleaning the building, whether it's going outside and handing out tracts or are caring for people in need. But to walk in obedience is to serve in some capacity. And eventually, if you're unsure where your spiritual gifting lies, the church will figure it out. The Spirit moves among God's people, the Spirit of truth and wisdom, and, and will figure it out, and then you'll be plugged into that spot that you need to be. Don't pin the tail on the spiritual gift, though. Don't take one of those those lame spiritual gifts tests, because everyone knows those simply do not work. Uh, people are not two-dimensional. They're much more complex. And the reason why God has put you within a body of believers is to, number one, sharpen you as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another, but, but additionally, uh, mature you such that your spiritual gifts serve at maximum capacity for the greater good. But what about the other reasons why we don't walk in our spiritual gifts? I think many people don't walk in their spiritual gift because of fear. We're fearful that people might think bad of us. We're fearful that people might not think we're any good at what we're doing in terms of our spiritual gift. We're fearful that, uh, that people might take advantage of us if we, in fact, walk in our spiritual gift. And what do we have to fear? Being taken advantage of? People thinking poorly of us? 
None of those things are genuinely fear worthy. Don't let the fear of man get in the way of what God has promised for your life in terms of the ministry he has for you. Peter writes, verse 11, whoever speaks as one who speaks the oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. What Peter is saying here implicitly is that in everything that we do and in everything that we say, uh, we're to be doing that for the glory of God, that through Jesus Christ, God may be glorified. And so there are some expressions of Christianity which has historically have, have had a category for the sacred, and there are all these sacred responsibilities over here, and then over here there's the profane common responsibilities. So, you, you know, you got the priesthood or something over here, uh, you know, royalty, governorships are over here, and then you've got, you know, the watchmaker or the cake baker or something else over here. And, uh, and obviously these are more important because these are the sacred jobs and these are the less important because they're the profane jobs. But what Peter is saying is it's all sacred. There isn't a sacred profane dichotomy. You can't compartmentalize the world in that way because everything that you do is to be done to the glory of God. Every word that you say is to be spoken as if you're speaking the word of God. Everything that you put your hand to is to be done by the strength of that God supplies, which means you can't, you can't compartmentalize your life and have your church stuff over here and your secular stuff over here. And I say that as someone who attempted to do that. I, I know what it's like to work in a terrible job and just to wake up every morning dreading going back and doing the same thing and thinking that this job is totally meaningless. It's not serving anyone. It's not doing anything good. And I'm reminded of these passages which tell us that we're not really working for man, are we? In whatever capacity that we're in, whether we're a homemaker or an aircraft mechanic or whatever, in every capacity that we're in, we're working not merely for man, but we're working for God. And that is why we do the very best job that we can. That is why we strive for excellence, because we're working primarily for God. And when we speak, we season our speech with salt and humility because when we speak, we must speak as though we're speaking the words of God. In other words, we're representing God no matter where we go, no matter what we say. And so you be consistent in your speech. And you don't talk one way here and another way there, but you be consistent as one who speaks the oracles of God and as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. And so maybe you're in a job that you hate right now. You're in a job that you hate because maybe you disagree with the job. Maybe you think that you're better than the job. Maybe you uh, think that uh, the job is itself meaningful and not very important. Uh, these are all things that I thought of a job I once had. Let me just remind you and encourage you that whether or not you think that responsibility is worthwhile, it is obviously in, worthwhile in the sight of God because he has put you there. And if he has worked his providence such that you are in that place, there's a very good reason why you're there. Whether it is to witness to your co-workers or whether it is to knock the rough edges off your character, there's a reason why you're in that position. And so you work that position to the glory of God and you do better than all of your colleagues and you work your hardest in order to bring God glory through Jesus Christ. What about those of us who just... We mess up a lot, and we're not very good at our jobs, but we try, you know, and we try to be the best we can, but at times our best results in mediocrity. And uh, I don't know about you, but I've been there many times, and I often think about, uh, is my best going to be good enough? Is my performance day to day going to be going to be what my employer wants? Am I going to achieve what is necessary for excellence as a Christian? But notice way, the way that Peter breaks into a doxology here. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Why, why in the middle of this chapter is he breaking into a doxology? I, I think it's because of that phrase, glorified through Jesus Christ. Your relationship to God is completely and wholly mediated through Jesus Christ. When God sees you, he sees you through the lens of the blood of Christ. 
When you pray, you pray through the name of Jesus Christ. As you interact with God, you're interacting with God as a Christian who is in union with God's Son. And your work, as it reaches God's ears, just in the same way as your worship, as it reaches God's ears, has been perfected by the Lord Jesus Christ. And what matters is your intentions, your sincerity, and your honest efforts. And when you walk in the path of obedience and you work hard as worship, that worship is perfected when God hears of it, so to speak. Just in the same way that if you're not much of a singer like myself and you're singing unto the Lord in worship, don't worry about how you sound because by the time your singing reaches God's ears, it's been perfected because everything goes through Jesus Christ. I think this is why uh, Peter breaks out into this doxology because this is a winning prospect no matter how you cut it because Jesus Christ has been risen and it is through him that God will be glorified on earth just as he is glorified in heaven. And this is why Peter can say to him, be glory and dominion forever and ever. It's ambiguous as to what the referent is. Is this talking about God the Father? Is it talking about Jesus Christ? I think it's purposely ambiguous. I think Jesus gets the glory as he glorifies his Father. This was the pattern in the Gospels. Father, I glorified you on the earth. Now, Father, give me the glory which I had with you before the world existed. The Father saying to the Son, uh, I glorify, uh, I will glorify your name just as I have glorified it before. Uh, there's a reciprocal nature of glory between the Father and Son. The Son glorifies the Father. The Father glorifies the Son. And so it goes. And I think Peter is drawing upon that. But look at that word dominion. What do you think that means, dominion? What is dominion? Dominion is control. It is sovereignty. It is comprehensive, having a comprehensive grasp of a situation. Uh, being in complete control of something. And Peter says, to him belong the glory, we know that is, and dominion forever and ever. Dominion of what? Dominion of all things. Because notice it is in order that in everything God may be glorified. Uh, what Peter is saying is that may God's dominion be ever increasing in this world. Just as his glory ever increasing. It sounds to me like optimism. I'm just going to be real honest with you. It sounds to me like utter optimism when Peter thinks about the end of things. When he thinks about the fact that the end is near that the end is at hand. It sounds to me like he's got some optimism on his mind. And I wonder if he's thinking about those passages that we read earlier. Because Peter's constantly drawing upon uh, the Old Testament repeatedly to develop his epistle. I don't want to get into eschatology and tell you my view of the end times because I don't think it's important. What I do think is important is that you know that at the end, no matter what way this thing plays out, whether Jesus comes back this year or in a thousand years, the thing to keep in mind is that he wins and that his dominion will increase. That Psalm 110, 1 will be completed. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And that victory, you have an integral part to play and so, don't miss out on the greatest story ever told. Let's pray.